All right. All right, everyone, let's rock and roll. Um, I think to go ahead and kick things off, I just wanted to set the stage of uh, sort of the content we'll be covering and what I hope everyone walks away uh, from this webinar having learned or digested. And ultimately what we're gonna be walking through here is uh, some of the top tactics to improve your follow-up process. And I think ultimately um, what I'm hoping everyone walks away with, I think the top thing is an understanding of why following up matters and the transformational impact it can have on your business, right? Um, when you think about it, um, especially home services companies, and I think this really applies to any company, is built on uh, leads and how well you nurture and convert those leads, right? Uh, so really hoping that everyone walks away from this with an understanding of how uh, transformational improving your follow-up process really can be. Um, and then I think the secondary goal here would just to be to give you guys uh, some top tactics uh, to get more into like the how, uh, just to understand, hey, what actual actions can we take or should we be taking to really extract the most value out of the leads that, that we're generating, right? And I think this is something that applies to you know, not only paid leads from sources like, like Modernize as an example, but really should apply uh, to any sort of lead that, that touches your business. Um, and so I think to uh, get started, I just wanted to kick things off with a couple of introductions. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Megan Wolf. Um, I'm the manager of enterprise client strategy and development um, here at Modernize Home Services. Um, and really what that means is that I've spent my career here helping some of the largest home improvement and home services companies in the country uh, maximize the value they extract uh, from working with Modernize. Um, and really since you know, Modernize is in the lead business, what that really boils down to is uh, working with our partners to help them improve their follow-up processes, right? Uh, so that they're getting the most value out of the leads that we generate. Um, and then uh, I'll also go ahead, if you don't mind, Chase, and introduce uh, you briefly as well before I pass off the mic. Uh, Chase is a customer of Modernize. Um, I think they started with us back in 2019. And I think what's really powerful of that, with that story of them working with us, right, is that they started out, um, you know, small uh, scaling from taking in about a couple hundred leads a month to now building um, sort of like a powerhouse of a lead generation engine, if you will. Um, but Chase, I'll pass the mic off to you if you want to say um, a quick hello and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, again, my name is Chase Emerson. Um, I work with our sales operations and demand gen. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying that um, I have two call centers. Um, we have about 45 people calling every day. And I work with our sales enablement for both inside and outside sales, as well with our marketing department to work with partners like Megan uh, and Modernize, as well as we probably have about 12 partners at all times uh, running leads into our call centers, uh, setting appointments and tons of follow-ups. So look forward to uh, spending the day with you all. Thanks for joining us. And then Josh, pass yeah, the mic hey. off to you. What's going on everybody? Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, my name is Josh. I'm marketing manager at Hatch. Uh, we've been working closely with Modernize and Modernize's clients for a little over a year now. Um, we've got well over a hundred Modernized customers using Hatch to follow up with modernized leads instantly over text, email, and voicemail. Um, so ultimately, we're helping you guys set more appointments. And so I think Hatch here, we come from like a unique perspective in that we've got hundreds of, of contractors in all industries, solar, home improvement, home services, utilizing text and email follow-up in, in their business. And so we can see what works and what doesn't work. So I'm excited to today to share some templates and some strategies that you guys can implement in your business today, regardless of use, of if you use a tool like Hatch. So thanks for having me on, Megan. Cool. Thank you, Josh. And before we get into the meat of today's conversation, guys, I did want to uh, kind of remind everyone or re-announce that we are doing a giveaway of a Yeti cooler. Um, essentially how this will work is we're going to go ahead and draw the name um, and then announce the winner at the end of the webinar. Um, and I can't emphasize this enough, guys. I was kind of like a Yeti hater for a little while, but seriously, these things are as good as you've probably heard that they are. Um, they're awesome. So just really excited to be able to uh, kind of offer this um, as a thank you uh, for your participation today. And so without further ado, I won't linger here for too long, but just wanted to kind of give you guys a sense of what we'll be covering today. Um, again, I'll start out by really quantifying why following up matters so much. And again, just using numbers, um, some real client data, 
basically showing you guys the transformational impact it can have on the ROI that you extract uh, from any leads that you that you purchase or that you generate. Uh, from there, we'll kind of get into more tactical stuff. Uh, so talking through like, hey, how do we um, set as many appointments as possible? So again, starting at the top of the funnel, um, and then also emphasizing um, why following up in, is important, not only to get that initial appointment and to convert the lead, uh, but why it's important to nurture and communicate and follow up with your leads all the way from like lead submission and that appointment all the way through to the installation of the project. Uh, from there, I'll kind of pass the mic off uh, to Josh um, and he'll really talk through um, why uh, the, the method that you use to follow up matters. Um, I'm sure you all um, know it's hard to get people on the phone nowadays, you know, myself, like when, a, you know, a number rings and I don't recognize the number, I'm not going to answer it most of the time, right? And so we're really finding, um, especially over time, uh, that how you follow up uh, matters just as much as the frequency um, and the cadence and all that good stuff. Uh, from there, um, I'll kind of pass the mic off to Chase. Um, what I think his company does really well is... Uh, basically creating an environment in their call center and the way that their team nurture leads that really helps kind of um, add some fuel um, to their success. Uh, so we'll really look forward to that. And then we'll kind of wrap everything up with the Q&A. And so I know with that, let's kind of go ahead and jump into things here. So to get things started, guys, I did want to talk through some numbers uh, to show you all why following up is so transformational and why having a really robust follow-up process can really transform uh, the results that you achieve from any lead that touches your business. Uh, so just to walk through like a quick example, um, if you take, um, let's say a thousand window replacement leads and run it through like a weaker follow-up process, again, you know, there you're probably going, only gonna reach the easy appointments, the type of folks that, you know, respond or answer the phone on that first phone call, which results in like a lower um, appointment set rate less demos completed, and ultimately that trickles down to less revenue results. Um, meanwhile, as you kind of move forward to, you know, companies that have a good follow-up process, um, typically see um, double or more the revenue output from the leads that they generate. Um, and if you get into that best in class category, right, you can take the same 1,000 leads, run it through a more robust nurturing process, um, and essentially 4X uh, the revenue outcome, the number of customers you acquire, and that also is going to improve the ROI on any of your marketing efforts by that same rate as well. Um, I'll take a quick pause here if there's any questions. But again, just want to make sure that I'm really emphasizing why following up is so, so important. Um, and then I think getting into an even meatier example here. I wanted to share with everyone an analysis that we completed for one of our uh, top Windows contractors. They're actually one of the top window replacement companies in the entire nation. And essentially what we wanted to do here was uh, look at a uh, segment of leads that they purchased uh, from Modernize over a six month period. And we looked back a little bit over a year later uh, to basically understand out of all of the jobs that they sold, um, how often were those jobs sold within one day of the lead being created? So essentially those are, are your one call closes. Um, the amount of uh, jobs that were sold within a week of the lead being submitted, um, and then kind of the results from those more aged leads, right? And essentially what, what we found here is, is pretty uh, surprising and I think transformational and really speaks to the value of what uh, following up can do uh, for your business. Um, and so what we found essentially is that um, about half of the jobs that they sold and the revenue that they extracted from that subset of leads uh, was uh, basically the jobs were closed within a week of the lead being submitted, right? Which is a lot. Um, we always say that you're going to get the most juice from your squeeze uh, within the first week of that inquiry being submitted or that lead being created, right? But I think what's even more powerful here is that uh, about half, 45%, um, of the total revenue they extracted um, from that subset of leads actually occurred after a week, that initial week of the lead being created. Um, and even taking it a step further, 30% of the revenue that they attained from those leads uh, were from leads that were aged older than 30 days. Um, and so I think the main takeaway here, guys, is that you know truly um, following up really matters. If you're not following up on leads that are over a week old, you know, I've, I've, you know, throughout my time here at Modernize, I've heard people say things like, hey, you know, leads like this are dead after one week or after two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, what you can really see here is that the companies who, again, are going to extract the most ROI out of their leads programs, whether it's paid lead sources like Modernize, or again, really any lead that's touching their business. Um, the companies that are going to do the best and see the most revenue results are those ones that are following up, um, you know, even, you know, years after that initial inquiry is submitted, uh, because there's still more revenue to be extracted, more jobs to close, more appointments to set, um, just by uh, maintaining that robust follow up process, right? And then I think from here, um, now that we all kind of understand or we put some meat behind uh, why following up is so important, I want to kind of get into some more tactical things. Uh, just really talking through um, how you know we can follow up most appropriately, so you're getting those results and maximizing revenue output from you know any lead that that uh, touches uh, your business. So. I actually think one of the top tips for uh, how actually to schedule more appointments and how to follow up appropriately, um, maybe something that's underemphasized actually, um, is understanding uh, the whole customer journey and understanding where a consumer might be at when they're submitting that initial inquiry, right? Um, and this could be, you know, again, from a paid source like Modernize, it could be someone filling out a request on your website or even calling in. Um, I think ultimately what I want you all to take away from this is that, uh, you know, someone who's interested in, you know, getting, uh, you know, solar panels installed, getting their windows replaced, or really any type of home services project, those folks are going to be at different stages in their buying journey. Um, you know, sometimes I like to think about it in two different categories. Uh, there's going to be your doers and your planners. And so what I mean by doer, um, that person is going to be farther along in their, uh, you know, customer journey or their purchase process. You may reach some folks who are, you know, ready for an appointment yesterday. Maybe they've already gotten a few quotes and they're ready to, um, you know, make a purchase and speak to a contractor immediately. Uh, whereas, you know, you might get leads that are a little bit earlier on in their buying journey. Um, and those are more of your planners, right? Folks who, you know, just now started thinking about solar, right? Maybe they responded to an ad about how solar can save them money and they're um, needing basically more uh, follow-up or more time uh, to uh, kind of bring them down that path to purchase. And so I think one of the top things that, uh, you know, home services companies, marketers, salespeople can do uh, to uh, follow up more aggressively and set more appointments is really understanding that you know consumers where they're when they're submitting that inquiry can fall in uh, many different stages in that buying journey and you need to tailor up your follow-up appropriately to make sure that you're capturing all those folks right um, again that doer um, someone who's ready for an appointment now those might be the people that are answering on the first or second you know call or um, outreach that you attempt on that lead whereas your planners might might take more time right? And so I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle uh, to understand. And then getting kind of further into uh, tactics, I wanted to go ahead and share with you all some of the top uh, you know, actions that you can take or the categories of actions that you can take um, to really help you again, master the art of the follow-up and make sure that you're extracting you know, all the value from the leads that, that touch, touch your business as possible. And so I don't think any of these different categories of things are, um, you know, they may be new news to you, but uh, maybe not. But if I were to list the kind of the most important things that I see um, kind of take companies again from that like weaker category um, over to good and then all the way into best in class, it really comes down to a couple things and doing them really well. Um, and so again, those things are uh, speed to lead. I know Josh has some stats that he can share on this. We have some as well. Um, we find that uh, calling immediately, um, so just again, making sure that as soon as an inquiry comes in, you're contacting it as soon as possible, um, that can improve your contact rates by up to almost 400%. Um, from there, it's also really important to make sure that you're making uh, a lot of different and varied contact attempts and making sure that your contact sequence or the way you follow up is pretty aggressive. Um, one stat that we reference a whole lot um, in the industry is that um, at least six call attempts actually increases your chance of making the sale by about 90%. And so again, I think that kind of references back to that customer journey, right? Um, you need to make sure that you're following up a lot so that you're reaching um, you know, everyone that you can at the point when they're ready to make that buying decision, right? 
Uh, so that's also a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, other than uh, kind of the tactical stuff around speed to lead and contact sequence, um, I think again, maybe an under discussed um, element of how to really master following up and to improve your, your conversion rates, maximize ROI is making sure that balance of staff and lead volume is, is uh, appropriate. Um, you know, throughout my experience in the industry, I found that, you know, if that balance is off kilter a little bit, meaning that you're, you know, receiving too many leads for the size of your call center staff, or even too many leads for the size of your sales staff, uh, that can kind of clog up your pipes and um, make it harder to follow up with your leads appropriately. And again, really achieve the maximum um, ROI that you can uh, from any, um, you know, source of leads that, that you're generating. Um, and then I think lastly, um, and again, we'll kind of delve into this um, a little more um, in a couple minutes here, but the uh, type or the way that you reach out to a homeowner or a lead is also vitally important. Uh, so making sure that you're incorporating more things other than phone calls. I think we've all seen the rise of, you know, things like text messaging and email uh, start to become even more important. Again, as you know, people, you know, don't answer their phones as often as they used to. Um, so again, all of these things are really crucial um, to really master the, the art of following up. And so before I pass things over to Josh, um, you know, earlier, just kind of talking through um, what's more most important from a top of funnel perspective. So how do we take our leads and convert them into as many appointments as possible? Uh, something that I think is also super important to emphasize is that following up actually matters a whole lot throughout the entirety of your customer's journey. So not only making sure that we're following up to kind of win that appointment, but also making sure that we're following up through every single stage um, in the uh, customer creation journey, if you will, um, to make sure that we're kind of ticking all the boxes there is, is really gonna help, again, improve your results in an even more powerful way. Um, so as an example, you know, once you set the appointment, making sure that there's follow-up to confirm that appointment. So doing things like sending out a text message or an email uh, to confirm the date and time of the appointment, making sure that you're following up. Um, and even after the um, you know, paperwork is signed, uh, making sure that there's uh, an appropriate follow-up process to keep the homeowner informed on what's happening with the project, right? And ultimately, the reason these things are so important is because you know, happy customers are going to turn into referrals. So the better job you can do in leading your customer down um, kind of that journey, again, all the way from lead create to install, um, is really going to help create ha happy customers, which generate referrals, which is only going to maximize, again, um, you know, the, the value and the growth trajectory um, of your company. And so I think with that, we'll kind of transition into um, talking through why um, the method that you follow up matters so much, right? And before I pass the mic over to you, Josh, um, I'll just walk through some stats that we collected in a recent survey. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Modernize is one of the largest um, lead generation services in the home improvement space. Um, and something that we frequently do is survey our homeowners to find out, you know, lot, lots of information about them, what they need, what they want, um, you know, figure out how we can improve the service that we provide. Uh, but a recent one, we, a survey we did was actually asking homeowners about their preferred um, method to be contacted by a contractor. Um, we found some pretty powerful stuff. Um, the first bullet is that actually 40% of uh, homeowners who responded to the survey said that they preferred um, to be texted by their contractor as their primary form of communication. Um, again, I, this is the, I wasn't surprised that this was the lowest on the totem pole, but I think I was surprised by um, you know, how small the number was, but only 6% of homeowners actually said they preferred uh, to be contacted over the phone. Um, again, which is su super powerful, super important for us all to understand. Um, and then lastly, 55% uh, of homeowners we surveyed uh, said they would prefer uh, email as their primary communication method. Um, so I think with that, um, Josh, I'll kind of pass things over to you. Um, and again, he'll kind of talk through um, getting a little bit more deeper in the how side of things and why uh, following up and varying your contact method uh, matters so much. Um, 
Yeah, Josh, good. I'll kick things over to you. <laughs> yeah, good, good stuff, Megan, all around. And I, I appreciate we had some questions come in, and I, I think it might make sense to go through a couple of these right now. Let's do it. Um, <clears throat> the first one came from Steve, and I encourage you guys. It's at the bottom of the screen, the Q and A. Ask your questions. Like, let's let's jump in and help you guys. Uh, Steve says, my biggest question is why. Why do people fill out a form saying they're interested in a product or service and then they won't pick up the phone when you call them or in text or text or email? It's like, yep. yeah, I mean, it's, it's a common issue, right, Megan? Oh, a hundred percent. And so I think there are, and, and I would say this is something that I hear a lot in my seat, right? Um, you know, working with contractors directly, helping them, you know, get the most out of the leads that they purchase for Modernize. This is something that comes up all the time. Um, and I don't want to skip ahead too much, but I'd say one big thing is that uh, just based on consumer behavior, we actually find that most people are submitting web forms uh, kind of during the hours of like 9 a.m. probably to around 5 p.m. And what time does that coincide with? Um, it's when people are at work. And so from a really basic perspective, a lot of the reason that people aren't picking up the phone maybe right away is that they're browsing the internet during work or when they're busy or doing something like that. And the time at which you're calling them isn't a time where they're ready to talk. Um, so I'd say that's a big piece of it is that getting the timing of things right is important. Um, then I'd say a second uh, answer to that is that it kind of harkens back to that customer journey um, kind of sequence that I displayed earlier. Um, is that, you know, when sometimes when people fill out a web form, it's because they're ready to you know, speak to a contractor yesterday, they're ready to hire someone immediately. Um, sometimes when people fill out one of those web forms, they might be earlier in their buying journey, they may have just started thinking about, you know, putting solar panels on their home, right, or they may have just started thinking about replacing their windows. And so I think that's a big element of it as well is that some folks might be more in the, I want information stage. And again, they might need a little bit more coaxing, if you will, uh, to bring them from that point of, hey, I'm interested in, in doing this project at some point um, and kind of bringing them further down the funnel to the point where they're ready to hire someone now and they're you know, hopefully re ready, ready to hire uh, your company. Um, so I'd say it's, it's kind of one of those two things. It's either the, the timing's a little bit off or um, you know, someone might not be answering the phone because they're at a different, you know, earlier stage in their buying journey, maybe. And then I'd say the last thing, and I think this is where um, you know, the power of tools like Hatch come in, is that, you know, if you're like me, like people just don't answer their phone nowadays if they don't recognize the number. Um, I think Josh, you have a stat on this later on, but it's something like, you know, 97% of people, if they don't recognize the number, they aren't answering the phone, right? Um, so I think there's an element of that is that, you know, people might not know that it's you that's calling or they have that kind of, um, you know, immediate barrier up of, hey, if I don't recognize the number, it's probably a spam call. I'm not going to answer it. Um, so Josh and Chase, I don't know if you have anything to add there, but um, I think it kind of comes, comes down to those three things. Yeah, Megan, I think the last point, you know, I saw Steve, uh, he popped in and he said, but they're retired folks, um, right? I mean, it, it could play into what type of leads you're buying. If you're buying a, uh, a multi-leg deal, for me, um, I've found that sometimes people can be overwhelmed with how fast uh, their phone rings and with multiple numbers. And so I'd say, look, don't be afraid to try something different, right? Um, if you don't get it on that first contact, that's where following up really, uh, really can help. Um, and also um, we do things with A-B testing um, on different numbers. So we'll use local area codes as well as we have a registered uh, you know, company number that we can actually get through with some of these screening devices and it says Posigen, right? And so if you can work with your, your agents to get your name out there, your affiliates to kind of, you know, maybe either put your logo somewhere or somewhere where they're more apt to say, hey, wait, that's that phone call I was looking for. I filled out that lead form. I want their information. Whereas what Megan was saying is, is, is folks just are less likely to answer uh, numbers that they don't know these days. Uh, so all good feedback, Megan, uh, but thanks for opening it up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Any good other stuff. questions, well, Josh? You're going to have to help me out. I can't see the question pool not when I'm driving the bus on the screen chair. So no worries. I'll, I'll, Steve, we'll get, we'll get to uh, your question about time of day in a minute. Um, but Megan was talking about speed being of the essence. Uh, data shows you're seven times more likely to actually set the appointment if you respond in one hour versus two hours. And an even crazier stat is if we look down in the funnel, you're actually 21 times more likely to, to close a deal 
if, if we were to look at the sales funnel, if you respond in less than five minutes, but obviously we talked about there's different methods of communication. What we're finding here at Hatch is, is SMS texting is actually one of the most effective ways to get in touch with homeowners, especially if you're buying leads, you're cutting through the noise and your text message is going to be open and read within three minutes. Data shows your 90, 95% of the texts that you guys send out are open and read within three minutes. What's really cool guys is the spam filtering capabilities that the carriers have implemented have not transcended into SMS in the same way they have transcended into phones, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of calls that get screened. And I, I, I saw that somebody asked a question about call screening, which we'll touch on in a bit. Um, that is less likely to happen with SMS. And so the good news is that your texts are going to get opened. You just need to make sure that the follow-up is personalized. And I'm going to share with you guys the way at which we encourage folks to follow up with leads the second they come in. And Bathfitter is a good example of a company that's done yeah. that really, really, really well. So Bathfitter, they started out, they were buying leads from a lot of different sources, including Modernize, and they were only estimating 5% of them. What we did is we worked with them to establish a follow-up program using our tool. And now they are instantly texting, emailing, and leaving a voicemail with every new lead. So they're actually not calling the lead until later on, um, but they're dropping a voicemail, they're texting, and they're emailing. And if they don't get a response after the first day, they're continuing to follow up. So whether or not you use a tool like Hatch, make sure you set reminders either in your CRM or in your phone, whatever you need to be doing to remind yourself to continue to follow up. I can't stress this enough, guys. We're finding that a majority of people actually end up responding to a text asking when a good time is for an appointment after day two or day three of following up. And this is very prevalent with paid leads. Because let's be real, as Megan said, these aren't leads that are ready to necessarily buy right now. They could be in research mode, right? So let's just be cognizant of that when we follow it up, when we follow up. And I've got a couple of templates that you guys are going to, um, I, I think, see a lot of, of uh, results from. And the results from Bathfit are implementing that is they went from setting 5% of the leads excuse me, they went from estimating 5% of the leads that they were generating to 25% of the leads. And that brought about $34,000 in additional sales just from their modernized leads. So it more than paid for their modernized leads and then some, of course. Uh, and so what I can encourage you guys is sort of just like this outsider here. Um, it's it's it, it, Don't immediately default to say the leads are bad. I think it's easy to get in that mindset. Uh, look at your follow-up process and see how many you're setting and see how you're, you know, how often also you're, you're following up with those leads and then have that introspective look at your business and adjust and implement some of the things that we're talking about today. And I guarantee you, you and guarantee you, guarantee you, excuse me, I'm getting choked up about follow-up. Uh, you'll set more, <laughs> you'll set more appointments from those leads. So if we go to the next slide, it's really interesting. Um, we have like a, what I call a day five, a five day template to set appointments. Lead nurturing can happen later on in the sequence here. This is just strictly a appointment setting play. So obviously within five minutes, you want to get in front of them over text, email, call or a voicemail. Our technology allows you to just drop a voicemail in their inbox and it's the same number they text from. So it's, you know, very familiar and you just make the voicemail to be generic. Like, Hey, what's up? This is Josh at Josh's window company. Saw you requested some information. Feel free to shoot me a text back with times that work best for you. Something like that uh, is really effective. Um, day two, ask a discovery question, more information about their project, what they're looking to accomplish. And then day three, we, we encourage folks to get a little bit more specific, like, Hey, would Thursday or Friday work for an appointment or next Thursday or Friday, whatever you guys want uh, to, to book your calendars. Um, that's a really effective uh, time to actually be pointed with that follow-up and what day to have the appointment. And then of course, day five, uh, we call it a breakup text. Um, it tends to be pretty effective and we encourage folks to use the term, close your file. So, hey, are you still interested in replacing your windows, doors, roofing, siding, whatever, uh, or should I close your file? And if you say close your file, 
people are going to be more likely to say, oh, no, no, wait, no, 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 wait. I'm actually putting this off until next month. And then you can set up a follow-up cadence to reach out in the following month. So close your files are really effective verbiage on that breakup text. So instead of me kind of talking in theory, uh, this is how Bathfitter actually ended up closing um, a bathroom remodel deal. Uh, and we see here that the first day we texted, hey, Weldon, this is Mark with Bathfitter. I got your information from the form you submitted. And this is, a, this is a modernized lead. And I wanted to get you scheduled for an appointment or answer any questions you have. How can I help? Well, Mark didn't get a response. So we followed up automatically using Hatch and said, hey, this is Mark with Bathfitter again. I want to make sure I, I get you a quote. How Have you started your project yet? How can I help? Again, we're kind of making it more generic, allowing the homeowner to, to respond and share more information about the project. Didn't respond to that. So we follow up again and say, hey, I had a note to follow up and book time and get you a quote to something closer to the end of the week now. So if we look on the right-hand side, the homeowner, Weldon, responded and said, all right, let me know what day you can come. And this deal, this this just by following up, and it took three three follow-ups, they closed a $5,800 bathroom remodel, right? Uh, and so this sale wouldn't have happened if they just gave up after the first touch point. And Megan, I know you've got some interesting stats around time of day to follow up. And we had a question that came in about that specifically. And I saw that on the previous yep. slide. Oh, yeah. So I'll uh, walk through what this chart is displaying briefly. Briefly, um, Essentially, what we looked at is throughout all of 2020, all of the home services increase we generated throughout all the different verticals we service, right? So this takes you anywhere from, um, you know, ho home security inquiries all the way up to like solar projects and like multi-window replacement jobs. Um, and essentially what this is looking at is uh, the hour of day that the inquiries are submitted. Um, and we see this like typical flow chart happen um, or this like belt, this curve, if you will, happen, regardless of what industry segment that it is. But I think the short takeaway here is that uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, customer traffic behavior and when they're actually submitting the increase, um, it's usually ramping up in the morning. Again, this is all in central time, uh, you know, between the hours of like 7 a.m. and then kind of trickling down um, throughout the evening. Um, but just because, again, when they're submitting the inquiry, it is important that you're calling quickly. So you do capture those people who are kind of right there and ready to answer the phone. Uh, but to Josh's point earlier, it's also important that you kind of don't give up after that initial contact attempt uh, because folks might be busy um, during those hours of the day and maybe they're ready to answer their phone the day later or later that evening. Um, so just important to keep in mind, um, you know, consumer behavior. Um, when you're thinking about your follow-up approach. Uh, but Josh, I don't know if there's anything you want to add here. Um, yeah, Steve had a good question. And this is why I'm encouraging you guys to text because I mean, let's be real. We all get distracted at work and <laughs> surf around. So uh, they're not going to be ready for a call. They want to take a call. Uh, and so that's why I, I love SMS, especially for these type of leads, super effective. Um, and Steve had a good question. If a live lead comes in at 1130, should they be called right then? Or is it more considerate and appropriate to wait until the next morning or daytime? What we encourage people to do using our platform is send that initial text in the very least and say, hey, thanks for reaching out. Well, we'll be in touch tomorrow or something like that. And that could be an automated text that goes out. Um, but uh, Chase, I mean, from your experience, man, like what, what does that look like? I mean, I'm sure you get leads coming in at all hours of the day. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, we're focused on, on the calls from 8 to 8. Uh, we find we get a lot of contact in the evenings or the mornings. Um, and so our playbook is really to call each person three times a day for the first five business days. And we're spreading those calls out between the morning, right around lunchtime in the evening to make sure that with each prospect, we're getting a call in when we think that they may be most likely to answer that call. Cool. I think going back to the, if it was an 11.30 p.m. question, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to take a phone call like that late in the evening, right? So I um, totally agree with Josh, Josh's approach. If you can touch that uh, consumer automatically, again, with kind of like a friendly text, giving them the heads up that you're going to be making a call, or maybe give them a chance to respond when they'd like to talk to you. Um, I think that's the win there. I think it can get pretty tricky, you know, calling through those evening hours for sure. Yeah, text acknowledgement on that would be fantastic. Um, but that's my that's my 801 call right there. We're we're signing that deal up. 
Cool. <laughs> Love it. And and Thomas had another good question about does it make a difference with the type of renovation request? Yeah, there's certainly going to be reno- going to be requests that require a little bit more qualification. You don't just want to go in for the appointment, you got to qualify. Uh, and so depending on your process for qualifying leads that come in, uh, you can always tee it up, tee up a call. And so what I encourage people to do is like, uh, say for example, uh, Hey, this is Josh with Josh's roofing company. Uh, when's a good time for me to give you a quick call to talk about what you're looking to do. So that way you don't have a rep chasing an unqualified lead, uh, and wasting their time. You can have some time, some time to get on the phone. Cause of course people are going to expand on the, over the phone. They're not going to type everything out that they're looking to accomplish. So hopefully that, that helps Thomas. Yeah. I have one other thought on this. There are some, uh, projects, I think inherently are project requests that have a little bit more like urgency behind them than others. Uh, so to your point, um, if it's like a request for like an HVAC replacement or an AC unit replacement, you better believe that like speed is the name of the game there. And yeah. that's how you're going to win the appointment. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I live in Texas. If my AC goes out, like I am going to go with the first company who contacts me and the first company who can like make the appointment happen as soon as possible. Um, and I'd put um, requests like I think plumbing, you'd kind of put in that category and even to a certain extent roof replacements. Yeah. A lot of times when people are thinking about a new roof, it's because something's broken on their home and they, they need it fixed. Um, whereas other projects, um, I think you put like window replacement in that category where it's rarely like an urgent, I need this fix now type of inquiry or decision. It's more of like a, hey, I've been thinking about upgrading my home or I heard they can be more energy efficient. Um, I'd say, you know, services or like home services requests in that category, uh, following up quickly is still super important. Uh, But I think that's where the kind of long play and, you know, more extended, you know, follow-up sequence is more important because if someone's interested in windows, you need to bring them from maybe hey, I would really like to replace my windows or I'm just starting to think about it or it would be nice. You kind of need to take them from there to like, I'm ready to sign, you know, a contract, you know, today um, for windows. Um, So I think that, I think inherently the type of request it is or the type of project it is, um, can be the customer can behave different based on like the urgency of the project or the need to have versus nice to have aspect. For sure, for sure. So I know we skipped around a little bit, Megan. Um, yeah, I can kind of press forward here. And so I think we want to talk a little bit about Hatch, Josh. Yeah, we had a couple of questions come in. Like, do we help people set appointments? Yes, we do. Um, we do it programmatically. It's all automated. So essentially we connect up to your website forms, your Modernize or Quinn Street, wherever you're getting leads from. And the second the homeowner clicks submit, you're going to beat every other contractor to that lead uh, with an instant text, email, and a voicemail. And then if you don't get a response after the first day, we're going to continue to follow up. So all you need to do as a, as a contractor, sales rep, all of you guys on the line, all you need to do using our platform is jump in when you get a response. So literally it's all done for you. When you get a response, you'll get a a notification on your phone. You can jump in and set up that appointment directly using our mobile app or using, um, you know, our web app that we have as well. Uh, and of course you can call out from our platform. We have that functionality, you know, everything's in one place, all your conversations throughout the whole sales cycle. And this is why I'm really excited to be, be working with all these modernized customers. I know there's a ton of them on the line. Hopefully a lot of you guys are hatch customers right now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of results, just like we talked about bath fitter earlier setting, going from estimating 5% of appointments to 25%. That's not a BS metric. That's legitimately, you can go on our website, check out the case study. Uh, they legitimately 5X their, their lead to estimate rate just by implementing this follow-up strategy that we're talking about. So again, like I mentioned earlier, whether or not you use a tool like Hatch, just have assign somebody to follow up and make sure you're following up over m- multiple channels, text, email, voicemail, calling, uh, and then continue to follow up until you don't get a response and establish that nurture cadence. So I, I, I have to encourage that. It's absolutely critical. And that's why we're here today. Yep, totally. And Josh, I know that not to linger here too long, but I know that you can leverage Hatch not only to win that initial appointment, but I know you guys also do things like, um, you know, some rehash campaigns or even like this text flow here. It looks like this is a follow-up like after the initial appointment. Um, So I think that kind of speaks towards um, the, hey, following up is important, not just to go from the lead to appointment stage, but also to go from the appointment to sales stage as well. 
Um, so I don't know if there's anything you want to touch on there, but um, lots of opportunity, I suppose, to follow up throughout the entire, you know, customer journey. Yeah. yeah. And most of this webinar has been on like the front end appointment setting. Yep. Um, but, but yeah, a big, a big area of, of area of opportunity that we found is, is with rehash. So we connect up to your CRM, whether or not, whether you're using like market sharp, job Nimbus, job progress, whatever you guys are using, uh, we connect up to that. And when you mark a, uh, appointment as like not sold or demo, not sold or whatever, uh, we can kick them off in like this rehash follow-up campaign. And so this ends up being pretty effective. We see people increasing close rates anywhere from like seven to 10% just by implementing follow-up after the appointment. So obviously, yeah, follow up after the lead comes in, get that appointment set. But like, if you don't, if you don't one call close that appointment, make sure you have a follow-up strategy and, and we can certainly help you with that at Hatch. Yep. Cool. And I think from there, this is where I'd like to um, actually kick it over to you, Chase. Um, and so I think I kind of set the stage in this on this topic, um, kind of on the onset when we were talking through the agenda. But uh, something that um, I think is really powerful and that Pause Agenda does really well in particular um, is creating a um, motivating and exciting environment um, to actually encourage their staff to get out there and set more appointments, smash the phones, and basically just like kill the sales game um, as, as a whole. Uh, I've actually visited their operation. Their HQ is down in uh, New Orleans and Louisiana. And the environment that they've created there is, you know, I might go as far to say unlike um, any other environment um, in terms of like a call center setup that I visited. Um, you've got like flashing screens there. You've got people high-fiving each other. Um, and so just wanted to pass the mic over to Chase just to talk about, you know, his overall thoughts on uh, kind of the art of the follow-up. Um, and I think specifically um, talking through like what he does from like a staff motivation perspective to encourage his team to follow up um, because it, it, it can be tough. Like I've been there, like one of my first jobs was cold calling in a B2B setup and it can be, you know, tough to encourage people to like get out there and, you know, really push and, and follow up as aggressively as you need to, to win as many appointments as possible. Um, but again, I think this is something that Posigen does incredibly well. Um, so Chase, I don't know if you want to go ahead and get started, but um, yeah, passing the mic over. Thanks, Megan. You've uh, definitely talked it up. So hopefully I can, uh, <laughs> I can keep up to that intro. Um, but yeah, you know, it, for us, it really is. It, it's all about a culture. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, being that this is a podcast today, I wanted to prepare something really simple, something that you could remember. Um, and so we were talking about incentivization. And for me, it's, it's three C's, right? Um, everyone's going to start with and want to know their compensation. And so here, you know, I just wanted to share with this group that for us, it's very important that we compensate our teams both on kept appointments, not set, but kept appointments. And we also, we also incentivize them for the approved sale. Why do we do that? Um, I can tell you a lot of people kick it back and they tell me, hey, I'm inside sales. I can't, you know, help if a deal sells. Um, but this is how we bring the follow up through. Um, we actually have our inside sales teams setting appointments, confirming appointments. They even follow up with customers after the initial sit to see how it went. And this is how we've created that buy-in by really bringing folks into the, the company's overall mission, not just let me set a quick appointment to get paid. Um, and so that's important to me. Um, second, competition. Uh, you know, everyone's looking at gamification these days. We live and breathe competition. Every day, people have activities that they have to achieve. And as Megan just told you, there's screens, uh, there's Slack channels, there's automations built to basically notify people all through the day when they hit 50% of their activity, when they've done 100%. When they set an appointment, they get to pick a video that plays. And I can tell you, Cardi B plays a lot in my call centers. Um, and so, you know, everyone gets the, to, to, they get used to who's basically appointment set uh, you know, theme goes off. And so as soon as someone sets an appointment, you can see other folks reacting uh, on the phone, off the phone, high-fiving, you know, really get excited for team wins, which is a perfect segue into the last C, which is culture. This is the most important thing you can do when you're building a call center, or like I like to call it now a contact center, is you have to build a culture that is focused on, first for us, it's helping people. You see the mission here. Um, but it has to be focused on fun and it has to be focused on team wins. This is a tough job. Um, there's so many people talking about bad numbers. What do I do with them? 
What do I do with no's? I have so much rejection. This is how you fight that. You really have to build a culture that's motivated around, let's have fun while we work through this. And we really want to help people. We have a reason to do this. We push through the no because people want to be helped. And we know that we can do that. And so that's really important to me when it comes to incentivization. Um, and then the other thing we prepare for you all today is automation, right? I think a lot of this calls about that. You saw what Hatch can provide for you. It's great. Um, I'm going to step back from that a little bit. And I'm going to say for me, um, again, I kept it really simple. We're going to go about the three P's now, right? For me, it was about defining our product. And I think when you look at your product, you have to determine that. Megan said it. Right. If you're dealing with ACs in the hot, you're going to have to be really focused on speed to lead. Um, for us, we're in solar, we're in roofing, we're in energy efficiency, and we've built a really unique value proposition. And it's important that I know what that value proposition when I'm building the rest of my automation. Right. And so when I understand now my product, I have to look at people. You have to have good personnel. And so with a highly competitive product, one product where maybe your competitors are at the, the same or very close price point and there's not a bunch of different value you can bring to the pipeline. It may be very important that you focus on someone who's self-motivated, who is a grinder, who can push through objections. Whereas in my business, we're really focused on people. We're focused on helping them and we do it in such a different way that we really focus when we're hiring people on what's drawing them to the opportunity, right? If they're mission driven, if they want to help people, we actually hire folks for that reason, instead of maybe the person who's got 20 years of experience of hammering the phones. And so I think it's really important for everyone here to define your product, to define then what people you have to have in this role. And then once you have that set, you can start to build that process, right? If you, if you need to have speed to lead be the first thing, Hatch is a great product for you. Um, if you are looking to build really good relationships, Hatch is still going to be good, uh, a good value and other things are still going to be there, but you may want to do different things first. You may want to prioritize the people. You may want to prioritize a texting or an auto dialing system. Um, for me, it's really about our cadence, right? The way we follow up with people, we try to do things different, right? So everyone's going to call within the first five minutes. We call as well. But we're going to get beat sometimes and that's okay and so we continue to follow up with people around their schedule we send them emails and different pieces of information trying to build them deeper into our funnel so we can make a meaningful contact at some point to share the message and we know when we do we convert at a high rate and so that's really the importance of follow-up deposition and, and hopefully something i shared today uh you know rings true to your business and something that can help you i'm, I'm, I'm here for questions at the end as well Thanks so much, Jason. I think another statement I think to maybe put a little cherry on, on top of this topic is that I'm always a firm believer that a motivated team in a room just like smashing phones is going to get more done than like an unmotivated team with all the bells and whistles from a technology perspective. I think, you know, a, a super like motivated team smashing phones plus technology is really going to take things to the next level, right? Uh, but I still think there's something really important, you know, for this whole group to understand is that the more you can do to motivate your team, that's really going to, um, you know, help you take things to the next level, I suppose. Um, so yeah. Hey, hey, Chase, can I ask you a question real quick on yes, the incentivizing piece? Um, I, this has come up with some of our, our customers. So like with, with respect to compensation, like how do you, so you compensate when the, when the appointment runs, when it gets scheduled, how, what does that look like? So for me, from a straight compensation, when I build a plan for a rep, um, I'm actually incentivizing them when it's kept, right? So okay. when they said it, um, we, we get excited about that every day, right? That's a stat on your uh, leadership board. You get a, you know, like I said, a Cardi B video potentially playing, but they're going to get paid when it's kept. And then they're going to get paid again when that deal is actually approved. So even if it's signs, it has to get through our approval. It's cool that they have skin in the game, especially when in your industry, right? You don't want to pass bad leads over the wall. You don't, but Hey, look, you know, we also gamify it from time to time. So, you know, if you're, if you're going through a, a time of the month where you need a lot of appointments, Josh, it's so easy to just jump in there and say, Hey, 
you know, first person that sets five appointments today gets, you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, a hundred bucks. Depends on what your, you know, service is and what your margins are. Uh, but, it, you know, throw a little bit of money around, throw an experience around, throw a trip around, and you'd be amazed to see what people can do. And as they break through those, those barriers that they place on themselves, they look back and they say, wait, if I did 10 for this trip, I can do 10 every day, right? And it, it, it's just been fun to watch. We, we've changed a lot of lives in the call center, and I enjoy it. Awesome. And I think from here, I know we're kind of wrapping up on time. Um, I'll talk very briefly, I guess, for those of you who don't know, um, just really quickly about Modernize. I know we spent a little time talking about Hatch. Um, Modernize is one of the largest uh, lead generation services for the home improvement industry. Um, and really the name of the game here, not only do we, you know, at face value generate leads that like help, uh, you know, contractors throughout the uh, country, like close more jobs, reach more homeowners, et cetera, et cetera. I think something to keep in mind and maybe something that sets us aside uh, from other lead generation services out there is that we care a lot about this stuff. You know, you'll have a dedicated um, account manager when you're working with Modernize that'll basically not only, you know, help you set up your campaigns, the nuts and bolts, but a lot of us are, are experts on the art of the follow-up. Um, and we think the bigger win in working with our customers is not just, you know, providing the leads, kind of setting it and forgetting it, uh, but just really doing everything we can to like help you succeed. Um, and we hope that that not only transforms the value you extract out of your relationship with Modernize, but the better you get at working like paid lead sources like Modernize, the better you're going to get at working any lead um, that like enters your business, whether it's like a referral or like an inquiry direct to your website. Um, you know, we just hope that you can really take some of the things you learn here or some of the things that you learn from working with Modernize and really apply that um, to the rest of your um, marketing and lead nurturing strategies. Um, and so I think from here, guys, we can just open it up to more q and I know we should also have the um, winner of the uh, Yeti cooler up soon, if not already. Um, and I think also to kind of finalize things here, um, we will have, a, we do have an ebook available that contains um, all of the content that we walked through today, plus some. Uh, so things like uh, voicemail strategies, more like playbooks uh, for like your day one, day two, day three, day four, et cetera, uh, follow-up cadence. Uh, but I think from here, like, unless you guys have any other topics like Chase or Josh, we'll just kind of open up the floor uh, to more questions. Hey, I know we had uh, McKenna's uh, question. Um, that's something I can actually uh, start with. Um, awesome. So how do you handle bad numbers? First off, know it's part of the game. Um, it is 100% part of the game. Um, and so you need to check to make sure that it's not out of line, but definitely, you know, coach your reps that, hey, make the next phone call. It's okay. Um, what do I do with my vendors from that standpoint? Um, there's really two options. Some people do returns. Um, I actually opt to not return. Um, I think our time is better spent uh, working on the next sale. And so um, with some of my larger vendors, we've actually negotiated pricing around it. Um, you can get discounts. There's things you can do. So I would say work with your partner and see what you can do about you know, working through those things that are just going to occur, you're going to get bad numbers. You're going to get quote unquote bad leads. There's no bad lead until the lead's name says, do not call me, right? Um, it happens. Just don't let it mess you up. Keep pushing. Um, what's the best time to call people? I think there's been a ton of, of that um, here. Um, I think the easiest, quickest guidance is, you know, less than five minutes. Um, you really need to be in that window. Um, I fail sometimes. It's okay. Um, but try to get there. Um, look at, at automations and different things to get yourself there. And then when it comes to people having Google screen their phone calls, um, I'd say the best thing here is to do some A-B testing. Um, like I said, we do some of our phone calls under our branded call out name. We do some calls under a generic, uh, you know, I say generic, but we use um, zip codes to, to be able to, to identify with that person's phone call. Um, testing those things out, um, to see which one you're going to get a better contact on um, or even moving things through sequences if you want to start by contacting someone with a local number presence start with that if it doesn't work pop them over to your company it could be that they're waiting for your call right like like folks have said they wanted this information sometimes you just have to get a little unique as to how you reach out and how you follow up to catch their attention because so many people have already dialed them okay. 
there's an there's another question that came in with respect to um, bringing on bringing up any on site consult fees. Um, you guys don't do you guys charge for appointments, Chase? We do not. Okay. You might be more qualified though. In a position that you do charge, like when when would that be a good time to to bring it up before the appointment? You know, I am not qualified for this question at all. Yeah. So I'm doing my best, Josh. Um, yeah. You know, if there's going to be a consult fee, I would say that bond and rapport is going to be really big. Um, I would want my inside folks really building up a relationship, really trying to find more than one pain point, right? So if I'm if I'm trying to sell something, I want to get that initial pain, but I want to dive in and have two or three pain points, have the bond and rapport done to where I can say, hey, you know, this is this important to you. I just want to let you know, we want a schedule coming out there and, and we're going to have a $50 fee, right? And, and, and be prepared for that objection, right? Oh, well, I'm not sure I want to move forward. Now you have your bond done, but you have three or four pain points that you can loop back and wrap that, that buyer up with, right? You can wrap them up and say, well, you told me this value to you was worth X amount of dollars. This is a small investment and it's going to be applied to your purchase when you um, actually move forward with us, right? Um, and so if it's that type of thing, I would say it's just really important to train those folks on the phone uh, to build those two steps in so you have something to leverage back when the inevitable objection comes. Chase, dude, that was like the word investment is is a word that not a lot of contractors are using right now. It's They're using the word cost to describe these things. But if you consider it an investment, that's like drill that word into your head, guys. Investment, investment, investment. Um, that's awesome. No, Megan, we have a, we have a Yeti winner over here. Yeah. Do you, do you have it? You want to take the, take the honors, Josh? I'll be the, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we go for it. I know we just, I know we just ran it through our, um, whatever you want to call it, the randomizer. Um, the winner is drum roll, drum roll, please. All right, McKenna Peters, congratulations! And I think McKenna's on the webinar right now, so awesome! Congratulations, you you went to Austin Yeti. <laughs> they're they're legit. That is cool. Um, hey, Steve, I saw you. You said it was you know that's tough to buy a lead. Uh, that's that's a non-working number. Um, I was gonna try to type it to you, but. I think it's pretty. It's, it's quicker for me to just to, to nail out. For me, uh, what what's what gets me through the tough part? Because yes, it is tough. Is to define goals before you get into something like this. Um, and if you're already into it, you can always refine those goals. So for us, we look at our cost per opportunity and our cost per um, acquisition. And so if you're defining what you are willing to pay to get an appointment and what you're willing to pay to get a deal signed, um, that really helps getting through this, right? Because you can look at the numbers and say, yeah, okay, I had 10 bad numbers, but look at my cost per opportunity. It's in line or it's better. Look at my cost of acquisition. It's where it needs to be and it's, or it's better. And if those things aren't matching, um, basically what you're looking to, um, to receive from your investment, then you, that's when you build really good relationships with folks like Megan and folks like uh, other affiliate managers. And you say, hey, look, this is the defined goals. This is where we need to be. Let's take a look at these lead sources and see what we can do to adjust. What do I need to do different? Because it could be you. And then what does the affiliate need to do? Because we have to either get in line or decide that this partnership isn't going to work. And I found that all of my affiliates, they are really keen to understanding that there's two parts of this business. If it's not working for the contractor, it's not going to work long-term for them. So they're willing to work for you. Yeah. And Chase, to add to that, the relationship is like so symbiotic. Like you said, if you guys aren't winning, like there's no way we're winning. Right. Um, and to that point, like our goal is to price the program in a way that again, achieves those outcomes, like making sure your cost per appointment is in alignment, making sure that your ROI is in alignment. Um, and we typically, you know, price the program to like account for like a small amount of bad leads. But to your point as well, Chase, if things are getting out of hand, um, that's when we're tracking things from like a data analysis perspective and also listening to our customers to make sure that we're optimizing and kind of 
you know, doing the right thing um, when, when those things pop up, so. Cool. I think with that, what do you guys think? Are we ready? Any, any other questions come through or, you know, we're a little bit over time here, but. Yeah, appreciate everybody sticking around and it was yeah. good. It's been a, been a fun panel discussion, so. Yeah, always, always sure. fun to hear insights from people actually like doing this every day, Chase. So like, thank you so much, man, for hopping on. Of course, I enjoyed it. This is fun sharing. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, and with that, we'll see you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>